that that was a it was an overview on what everything that happened in Jacobs during that week. And the the first thing one, one of the things that uh, again because of the way John happened into the Easter Rising, going to meet Anthony on Easter Monday, a lot of people are trying to say, look, he had nothing to do with the Rising. He wasn't in the loop. He wasn't one of them at all. He was forgotten about by the other people. But just listen to this. One month after the outbreak of the First World War, a meeting took place in the office of Sean T. O'Kelly at the Library of the Gaelic League on the 9th of September 1914. Present were all those who later signed the proclamation, plus Sean T. O'Kelly, Arthur Griffith, William O'Brien and John McBride. So that's the company he was keeping. And that meeting agreed on three things. They agreed that an insurrection should occur under these situations. One, if the British tried to introduce conscription. Two, if Germany invaded. Three, if the war appeared to be ending. Those three conditions, 1914, with John McBride there. And they also decided to seek military assistance from Germany. As you know, a minority of the volunteers objected to John Redmond's call on the 20th of September at Wooden Bridge for Irish men to join the British Army. The volunteers split, and Owen McNeill became leader of the yeah became leader of the volunteers. Unknown to McNeill, the secret element of the IRB within the Irish Volunteers, the Military Council set about planning the insurrection and various people were taking in the conspiracy at different times and this council then set Easter Sunday 1916 as the date on which they would take military action. The military council hoped that German arms would have arrived by then leading to the whole country joining in. The vol this is a thing, it's difficult to understand but in those years, the volunteers were parading every week round the country in military regalia with weapons, and the authorities were turning a blind eye to it. So there was nothing new in the volunteers going on manoeuvres. And that's the way that Easter Sunday look, would have looked to the British, and it did on Easter Monday. The volunteers were scheduled to have manoeuvres on Easter Sunday, which would see the inner conspiracy take the lead in Dublin. Owen McNeill learned late on what was afoot, and while initially agreeing to go along with it, changed his mind when he heard of the sinking of the Ode and its cargo of arms. As head of the volunteers, he issued a, a no public notice cancelling the manoeuvres. The conspirators then decided to postpone the insurrection to Easter Monday. As a result of the confusion, the numbers of volunteers who paraded was quite low, but the die was cast. Thomas MacDonough, in his capacity as Commandant of the Dublin Brigade, issued an order from headquarters on April 24, reading, The four city brigades will parade for inspection and route march at 10 a.m. today. Full arms and equipment and one day's rations. This order was countersigned by P.H. Pierce. John McBride had come into Dublin that Easter Monday morning from Glenageary to meet his brother, Dr. Anthony, who was travelling from Mayo to be married in Crumlin on the Wednesday. I'm fed up listening to reports on the radio and TV saying that John was on his way to the wedding. Yeah. You know. Uh, it's 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 a minor point, but it's annoying. Uh, John, what well, John was to be best man at, at 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 the wedding, and he he was early. They were to meet in the Wicklow Hotel on Wicklow Street, off Grafton Street, and John was early. So he strolled up Grafton Street, as thousands of people do, up to Stephen's Green to have a walk around. And in the Green, he was amazed to find Thomas McDonough with a group of the volunteers. Per, uh, in parading. And Macdonough, of course, knew McBride well. Everybody knew McBride well as a famous soldier. 
and they'd done it, invited, they told them what was happening and invited them to come with them and marched across the road almost to, to Jacob's factory and take it. Uh, because McBride was a famous soldier as a founder and co-leader of the Irish Transnational Brigade. Um, McBride was too well known by the police to have been part of the inner conspiracy, the military society. If you were having a, a, a secret society planning horizon, you don't want people that the police know, that everybody knows in it. But I should say this again is in passing, I don't want to go on too long. A lady called Jenny Wise Power, who admired John McBride so much and helped him so much, got a promise from Sean McDermott that the day of the rising, he would send a letter to John McBride telling him that today is the day, come on quick. That letter was written and that letter was, was tried to be delivered and it was taken out to Glenageary to, to McBride's where he was staying and of course he was gone. And several efforts were made to deliver the letter, initially by a man called Ignatius Callender. I have written, I think, a long article in Cochrane Amart about that letter that, that, because in a way it's, it's hilarious from one point of view but from another point of view, it's very interesting in the sense that it was another attempt by the inner conspiracy, keeping a promise to Jenny Wise Power to keep McBride involved. Anyway, um, what did I say? Where am I? McBride did not hesitate and was appointed second in command. His appointment was made on the back of a Jacobs invoice, <coughs> and this was found after the surrender and used in evidence as field court marshal. And I don't know whether Hugh was here, but I was very happy when I met Hugh in Dublin, Hugh Trier, some time ago, to be able to show him a copy of this, uh, of this appointment of McBride as commandant and three other people as lieutenants, one of them John McDonough Thomas's brother and uh, a man called another man, Michael McDonald, whom I will be quoting on John McBride. Um, and, and, sorry, it's in the exhibition, that, that document is in the exhibition for anybody to see it. And, uh, yes, John's military experience was to prove important to the garrison during the week, as he effectively became the military leader in Jacobs. And this is to Thomas McDonough's credit. I haven't known that much about Thomas McDonough and him recently, and he was... A wonderful man, a most noble man. And the fact that he was able to invite John McBride to join up at that late stage and effectively then cede military control to John McBride says so much about Thomas McDonough and the kind of man he was. Um, yeah, so they, they, they had to break into Jacobs. It was a bank holiday, so there was, there was only a, a caretaker and a few maintenance men in charge. And the caretaker was advised to go home, but he, he didn't. He stayed for the, the week. The maintenance men left, all right. Uh, and on the Tuesday and Wednesday mornings, the Jacobs garrison had to repulse an incursion down the Ratmines Road over <coughs> Ratmines Bridge by the Royal Irish Regiment and Jacob's garrison took them on and there were several casualties on, on Tuesday and Wednesday. It's hard to imagine in military terms that they would do this on Tuesday and they would repeat it again on Wednesday. But I don't know if you're familiar with, with what happened at Mound Street Bridge. Uh, um, even though the, the British fellows were being shot down the army general insisted that they keep going and take casualties. Um, the Jacobs garrison, after they repulsed an early attempted incursion by the British, were mainly active in supplying nearby garrisons, such as the Irish Citizen Army and the Royal College of Surgeons, with provisions, forming parties to gather information over what was happening in the city, and supporting other garrisons by sending men to join the fighting. They sent 20 men to try to help de Valera at Boland's Mills and Westland Row, but they had to return and the one casualty of Jacobs, a man called John O'Grady, was shot dead in that, uh, in that uh, excursion. 
All during the week in Jacobs, most of the action then was on sniping. And they were sniped from from uh, Rat Mines, Dublin Castle, and, Port and Portobello, and uh, some other place. Um, but all during the week, rumours were fast and furious that the Germans had landed in the south or were marching on Dublin and so on. The days were all mixed up because they got very little sleep and didn't run one day from another. One day at the end of the week, Pather Carney, age 43, an uncle of Brendan Began, who wrote the original English lyrics for the soldier's song, told another volunteer that there was no truth in the rumour, saying, look, don't mind it, it's a cod, there was no landing or anything like that. As low Sunday approached, the sound of heavy guns, machine guns to cattle, and the crack of the rifle gradually died down the previous day, and Saturday night had been unnaturally quiet. It was obvious that the struggle in Dublin was finished. Elizabeth O'Farrell and two Capuchin priests, Father Augustine and Aloysius, arrived at Jacob's with news of Pierce's surrender order. Thomas MacDonald left with them under a flag of truce to meet Pierce and to consult with the Enchiant. MacDonough was later given an ultimatum by General Lowe that the British Army would shell Jacobs unless they surrendered. Thomas B. Gay records that Con Calvert and Marable Lane, on hearing that MacDonough had gone to surrender, discuss surrender, requested him, Gay, to seek any message of surrender in writing from Major McBride. Gay went to Jacobs, found Major McBride and gave him the message. McBride's reply was, I have never in my life written an order for Irishmen to surrender, and I do not propose to do it now. To see the flag coming down from the top of our building, they will know the surrender is taking place. Beyond that, I will not go. On his return, MacDonough summoned all officers to the staff room. A silent company awaited his report. Major McBride sat calmly beside him at the table. Thomas announced that Pierce had surrendered and issued an order to all units to do likewise. He read the order pointing out that they were not obeyed to orders because Pierce was a prisoner at that time. He solicited the views of those present as to the most desirable course to be pursued. Each officer spoke up in turn and though some were in favour of fighting it out, the majority counselled obedience to the order. MacDonough listened carefully and then summed up. His voice shook as he spoke and finally with tears in his eyes he broke down crying. Boys. We must give in. We must leave some to carry on the struggle. Padakarni recorded that he discussed leaving with Major McBride, who told him, quote, Liberty is a priceless thing, and any of you and, and any of you that sees a chance, take it. I do so myself, but my liberty days are over. Good luck, boys. Many of you may live to fight some other day. Take my advice and never allow yourselves to be cooped up inside the walls of the building again. The common Amman women did not wish to leave either. MacBride spoke to Morani Shulpik saying, it would be better for you to go. He asked her to pass on a message to her neighbour, Clara Allen of Glenagiri, a woman he loved. He said, tell them we had a good week of it and ask her to mind the flag. One of the people that was appointed in Jacobs with MacBride was Michael MacDonald. He made a statement to the Bureau of Military History in 1949 from his home in California. This is what he said. I took part in the rising under Commandant John McBride in Jacobs, 1916. I was promoted second lieutenant during the course of the fighting. During the course of Easter week, I became closely acquainted with Major John McBride and had many conversations with him, the last of which remains vividly in my memory. As we were preparing to leave Jacobs to surrender in Bride Street, I said to him, Commandant, you better get out of here. He replied by saying, Mac, every G-man in Dublin knows me. And I said, I had been upstairs looking out, and there was not a G-man in sight, and there is no chance of you escaping if you remain here, and my advice is to get out. He slightly bowed his head as in deep emotion and replied, Oh, Mac, I wouldn't leave the boys. And he didn't. That is the last I saw of him. Following the surrender, I was deported to Nutsford and Franga. Following my release, the work of reorganisation began. I was appointed Captain Quartermaster in the 2nd Battalion to take the place of Michael O'Hanran, who was executed in 1916. I remained with the battalion until I took over the squad in early 1919. 
from an early stage I advocated the execution of those who were responsible for the identity of the men who were executed in 1916 and who were at the same time watching us, and he did. Last page. <laughs> Morning Schulte wrote of John McBride. He fulfilled all the expectations as a soldier of courage and resource. A gentleman, quiet, witty, always unruffled. Without exception, the volunteers in the building admired and respected him. It is sad to look back. Every man in the place went to confession. I think John McBride went. He told Bob Price he had been away from confession for some time. God rest him. John McBride was court-martialed before Brigadier C.J. Blackadder on the 4th of May. He called one witness, Clara Allen, to see her for the last time. Clara Allen is important to the story for several reasons. One is that she brought love back again into John's life. After his execution, Clara, who was a Methodist, converted to Catholicism to be closer to John McBride. She was baptised in St. John the Baptist Church in Black Rock. And her husband then died in 1937, and he was buried in Dean's Grange. And then she was thinking about her own demise. And she went to the parish priest just to check that she could be buried there alongside the husband. And he said to her, he said, but that's the Protestant plot your husband is buried in. You were a Catholic, you can't be buried there. So she thought about this and she says, look, well, if you don't agree to bury me there, she says, I'll convert back again. <laughs> <laughs> so the parish priest relented and, and the two of them are buried there together uh, in, in Means Grange. Um, and after his execution, she visited and stayed at the McBride Clara at the McBride family home. But this is some of the most important thing now, because he was living in in with Fred Allen and Clara at his execution. His papers and his artifacts were there in that house. Clara, one of his most valuable possessions was the the flag from the Transvaal Brigade. And Clara had that stitched into a mattress for safety. And she later, with her husband, Joseph, oh yeah, she gave it to, to, to uh, Eileen Wilson. Did I say that? Clara gave it to Eileen Wilson and Joseph. And they presented it to the National Museum. And it, it is in, still in the National Museum. But most importantly of all, from my point of view, John's papers were in that house and the family looked after them very well, kept them dead safe. Unfortunately, in a way, they almost kept them too safe because this, they were remained in the Allen family up until the 1970s when one of their family happened to meet Leon O'Brien and told them that they had the McBride papers in their house. And he said, for God's sake, he says, will you put them in the National Library? So they did. But unfortunately, when they put them in the National Library, they went in under the name, the Fred Allen Papers. And that was, if I may say so, that was one of the major achievements that I did in this story. I, sheer chance, because I knew my bride was connected to Fred Allen, I went to look at what I thought were the Fred Allen papers, and I discovered that they are the John McBride papers. And only for Clara Allen and the family, McBride's version of events and what happened could have been lost entirely. So that was one of the important parts about, uh, about Clara Allen. Uh, Father Augustine reached the prison at two o'clock on Friday the 5th of May and was immediately shown to a cell. He gripped the hand of Major McBride, who was quiet and natural as ever. Father Augustine writes, his very first words expressed sorrow for the surrender. He emptied his pockets of whatever silver and copper he had and asked me to give it to the poor. Finally, after placing his rosary tenderly in my hand, he uttered a sentence that thrilled me and gave that to my mother. Then he began his confession with the simplicity and humility of a child. After a few minutes, I gave him Holy Communion and we spent some time in prayer. 
I told him I would be with him to the last and that I would assist him when he fell. And the time was up, a soldier knocked on the door and we went down together to the passage where final preparations were made. The prisoner stiffens and expands his chest and quickly a silent signal, a loud volley, and the body collapses in a heap. I move forward quickly and anoint him. News of McBride's execution saw the Irish volunteers protest on Farnock Hill, Westport, and parade in arms to Westport. 32 men were arrested and turned at Berlin, in Scotland, and at Franga, in Wales. And my friend here, Harry Hughes, has written about that, and I look forward to the commemorations tomorrow. And with that, thank you for listening for so long. <laughs>